Hi everyone, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for a webinar hosted by a Trellis Company's research team. My name is Sana Megani, and I am facilitating and moderating today's webinar. We're excited to have you all here. I'll give it another minute to just let um, some more participants join in. Uh, we will be holding questions till the very end of the webinar, and you can um, send us your question either through the chat feature or the Q&A feature. If you want to do it in the middle of the webinar, just so you don't forget, you're happy to, you know, welcome to do that, uh, and we'll just hold it till the end, or you can send it all at the end. So if you have any questions with the audio or um, about connectivity, please send us a chat message, and we'll be back online in just a second. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jeff Webster, Director of Research at Trellis, and I'm joined by Carla Fletcher, also from Trellis, and also Wenhua Di from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Uh, we're excited to present the results of our new, re our new study on PLUS borrowing. Uh, for such an important program, there really is little we know about it, about how it affects the lives of so many borrowers. We're here to provide fresh information based on our newly released mixed method study. But first, a quick note about uh, who Trellis is. So Trellis Company is a nonprofit organization with a dual mission of helping student borrowers successfully repay education loans and promoting access and success in higher education. For nearly 40 years, Trellis has provided individualized services to student loan borrowers and support to institutions and communities. Uh, some may know us from the annual Student Financial uh, Wellness Survey. Um, now a little bit about uh, Trellis Research. Okay, uh, we provide uh, colleges and policymakers with insight into student success through the lens of college affordability. Uh, we invite you to visit our library of publications at the link provided in the slide there. Uh, also, please follow us on Twitter at Trellis Research for notifications of new research publications and discussions of a variety of higher education topics. Uh, that was at Trellis Research. We collaborated with Wenhua D from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas for this research. Uh, so we do need to note that the views expressed in the report are the authors and do not represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas or the Federal Reserve System. We're so glad Winwa could um, join us on this webinar today. She'll be discussing the PLUS borrower repayment patterns on the Trellis, uh, Trellis's extensive felt por portfolio. I'm also joined by Carla Fletcher, who's a senior research analyst at Trellis, and she'll discuss the interviews we conducted with 49 parents. But first, a little background on PLUS. So the title of our report is uh, Plus Borrowing in Texas Repayment Expectations, Experience, and Hindsight by Minority Serving Institution Status. So PLUS was created with a purpose. The Parent PLUS Loan Program was introduced in 1980 for parents of dependent undergraduates to more easily spread out payments. The program initially capped the amount parents could borrow and this is both annually and lifetime. But in 1993, this restriction was lifted and parents were allowed to borrow up to the cost of attendance. This change increased access to higher education for low-income families, especially those at low resource schools that struggled to meet full need. But the change is also greatly, uh, the change also greatly increased the total debt a parent could accrue. In 2011, the federal government tightened the underwriting standards, which meant, uh, which meant there were stricter eligibility requirements based on the presence of adverse credit, which is different and less restrictive than using a peer credit score. This led uh, to an increase in loan denial rates. Uh, the stricter standards were intended to better manage public funds and prevent families from borrowing more than they could afford. Unfortunately, this disproportionately affected African-American families, which had an immediate impact on enrollment rates at uh, historically black colleges and universities. The underlying uh, underwriting standards were later relaxed 
after the Department of Education faced criticism. As the cost of education rose, more families turned to PLUS loans to finance their children's education. Here we break out trends in college costs by school sector. Over the time period of our study, average net tuition, fees, and room and board increased 9% at public two-year schools, 15% at private four-year universities, and 30% at public four-year universities. And this is after adjusting for inflation. To meet these rising costs, families turn to PLUS more often. The blue line shows average annual borrowing in the PLUS, Parent PLUS uh, loan program and how it has more than tripled since the annual cap was lifted in 1993. In 2014, parents borrowed approximately uh, $16,070 per year compared to $5,151 in 1990. And again, this is adjusted for inflation. Cumulative balances have also risen sharply, as you can see by the green line in the chart. So the size of the program grew. The Parent PLUS uh, program has grown tremendously in the last two decades with a current outstanding portfolio of about 3.5 million borrowers and about $94 billion. You can see the sharp rise in Stafford borrowing in the blue in this slide. Uh, around the time that the recession hit and when new expanded loan limits uh, were implemented. Uh, then we saw a slowing of that borrowing as we came out of the recession. After a slight dip following the expansion of Stafford borrowing, the Parent PLUS program and the Grad PLUS programs uh, have continued to grow. And while borrowing is essential to access, the repayment of loans is important to families and to the federal government. The green line shows the percentage of the balance that is repaid, while the blue line tracks the five-year default rate. While some repayment difficulty likely resulted from the Great Recession, these trends were evident prior to that time. In 1999, parents had repaid 56% of their PLUS loans on average five years into repayment. But by 2009, that shifted to only 36% of the loans paid after five years. The rate of default has also risen over that time period from 7% of parents defaulting in the first five years of repayment to 11%. So in one picture, this is why we conducted the study. We'd prefer to see those lines keep spreading further and further apart. So a little bit about our methodology. Uh, first, we will talk about the analysis of the Trellis loan records. We examined our uh, Federal Family Education Loan Program portfolio as a guarantee agency in that program. To make it into the study, the child must have borrowed to attend a Texas institution and entered repayment between uh, October 2004 and September 2010. And so for those uh, uh, children, we looked at the parents who borrowed for them. Um, and this ended up consisting of 59,096 parent plus borrowers. We then tracked them for the first seven years of repayment. We were interested in more, uh, in more than how, they, how their repayment went. We also wanted to know how it later affected their lives of these parents and what they thought of the experience. So for this, we conducted 49 parent plus borrowers, uh, uh, conducted interviews with those borrowers and talked to them about a variety of topics. Uh, we sampled this to ensure that we had a variety of repayment outcomes, graduation statuses, school types, and loan amounts. While not representative, it did allow us to hear from people with a range of experiences important for understanding how people think about their lives as PLUS borrowers. And given how PLUS borrowing can vary by institution type, we wanted to break out by whether or not the school was a minority serving institution. And with that, we also categorized the repayment patterns. So when we say minority serving institution in this study, 
uh, we're only talking about those who attended schools that are either historic, uh, Hispanic serving institutions or if they're historically black college and university. Since in our portfolio, we didn't have any tribal colleges. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the repayment experience uh, and how we categorize those borrowing patterns. Um, we fir the first category is that green one, and that shows that they are successfully repaying their loans. And these include those who have uninterrupted uh, repayment patterns, those who are in repayment and had deferments, forbearances, or delinquencies, uh, but still stayed in repayment, and those that actually had become delinquent uh, without using a tool to pause repayment, uh, but are considered repaying. Uh, the next category, the red one, is default, and those include those with and without deferments and forbearances. Uh, we also looked at a category of borrowers who had no reduction in principal balance after five years of repayment. After seven years, sorry. And the final category, that purple one, is consolidation. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Wen Wah who will discuss the repayment patterns more closely. Thank you, Jeff. Here are some, uh, some of our findings based on the Trellis data. Overall, 75% of parent borrowers were successfully repaying, which means that their balance was at least $1 lower after seven years in repayment. 8% had defaulted, 7% had a higher balance after seven years in repayment and 12% consolidated. The parents whose children attended MSIs had a slightly higher incidence of default or no reduction in their principal balance and a lower incidence of having uninterrupted payments. Next slide, please. And turn to the next slide, please. And plus borrowers took out an average of about two loans, totaling a median of $12,304. Non-MSI parents tended to borrow more than MSI parents with a median of $13,740 for non-MSI parents compared to a median of $10,000 for MSI parents. Next slide, please. Among the plus loan borrowers, those who defaulted tend to have lower median debt and a lower average number of loans, whereas those who'd consolidated and who had not reduced their principal balance had higher number of loans and higher median amount borrowed. Next slide, please. The children of MSI parents were more likely to have attended two-year institutions and were less likely to have graduated. Next slide, please. Overall, about a third of parents had at least one delinquency and about a third of parents used at least one forbearance. Deferments were less common, with about 15% of parents using one in their first seven years in repayment. The two parent groups had similar rates of deferment use but the MSI parents were more likely to experience delinquency and use forbearances than the non-MSI parents. Now let me turn to Carla for the rest of the presentation. Hey, thank you, Wen Wang. Um, so for uh, the rest of the presentation here, I'm gonna go over some of our findings from the parent interviews. Now, one of the things that we wanted to know was what were the expectations of parents before they borrowed? Most of the parents we interviewed expected loans to be part of paying for college. Either their children would borrow or the parent would borrow or maybe both. For many, the amount they borrowed, though, was not expected due to various reasons, like receiving less aid than they thought they would get, than they thought their child would get. Um, or because of increases in school costs, um, or many other reasons. Um, those two reasons you can see in the quotes that are in this slide. Now, despite most of the parents saying that they expected to use loans as part of the way to pay for college, many parents did not have a good understanding of what their total debt would be at the end. Some just didn't have a good idea of what to expect in general. 
For others, they ended up with more debt than they expected because they had to borrow more than they anticipated on the front end or because of the added costs of interest and other payment delays on the back end. The parent in this quote on the slide talks about how the cost of forbearance and the cost of deferment led to being surprised by the total amount at the end. We also were curious about who was expected to repay the loan. While PLUS loans are in the parents' names, they are borrowed for the children's education, so it seemed possible that parents would expect their children to help pay the loans. But as it turns out, most of the parents we interviewed said that they viewed the Parent PLUS loan as their responsibility and did not expect payment help from their children. This was true among the parents overall and was particularly true among the MSI parents. Parents who made uninterrupted payments were the least likely to expect financial contributions from their children. There were some parents who did expect help, and usually they expected help after certain events, like their child graduating from college, getting a job, or paying off their student loans. Um, so this slide and the next several slides look at how PLUS repayment may have impacted other financial decisions. So we're gonna start here with general savings. We heard a wide range of responses when we asked about how repayment impacted their ability to save money. Those reporting a low impact described budgeting payments like they did with all their bills. Parents who reported experiencing a high impact said that the loan payments consumed a large portion of their income. Parents who defaulted and parents whose children attended MSIs generally described feeling a higher impact compared to parents with other repayment outcomes or parents whose children attended non-MSIs. About half of the parents we interviewed said that they did not feel an impact on their ability to make major purchases. For some of these parents who felt no impact, it seemed to be related to timing. The person quoted in this slide described it as basically lucky circumstances that they were not in need of major purchases during the time they were paying off the PLUS loans. They do describe having struggled to make their PLUS payments, but they were lucky in that they were not looking to do something like buy a house or a car while they were struggling. And then about half of the parents did describe some amount of impact on their ability to make major purchases. One of the common things we heard was that they would hold on to vehicles for longer than they might have otherwise because they didn't feel comfortable taking on another loan on top of their plus payments. The parent in the quote, um, in this quote on the slide describes how she felt like she could probably have gotten an auto loan. So she wasn't concerned about access to credit, but she didn't feel like she could make those car payments along with the payments on her other debts. And we asked parents if PLUS loan repayment had impacted other financial goals, and we left that question purposefully broad to allow the parent to define what that meant for themselves. The majority of the parents we talked to said that repayment had not impacted other goals. Of those who did feel an impact, we could discern some differences based on the severity of the impact that they described. Parents who said they felt a high impact talked about things like bad credit, um, having a negative impact on home ownership, and doing without. And those who described less of an impact talked about things like fewer or smaller vacations or having less money available for savings. And many of the parents that we talked to said that they were not surprised by the overall financial impacts of repaying their PLUS loans, whatever those expectations might have been. Those who were surprised talked either about how it took longer to pay off than they anticipated or they described some financial detriments, such as ending up with a higher total than they expected or specific things like interest accumulation or the cost of postponing payments. Parents who had uninterrupted payments were more likely to say that the impacts of the loans were expected compared to parents with other repayment outcomes. And finally, we asked about the impact on retirement savings. Overall, parents felt moderately comfortable with their retirement savings, but again, we saw a lot of variation. Parents who had uninterrupted payments and those who had consolidated were more comfortable with their retirement savings than those with other repayment outcomes. Almost half of the parents who said they were not comfortable with their savings said that they have used or will have to use some of those retirement funds prior to retiring in order to make ends meet. So that is concerning. And lastly, we asked parents if they had ever struggled to repay their PLUS loans. Most of the parents we interviewed said that they had struggled at some point to make their payments. 
Of the MSI parents who reported struggling, almost half of them described it as a regular, frequent, or constant issue. This ever-present stress was less prevalent among non-MSI parents who reported struggling. Parents who defaulted and parents who had not reduced their principal balance were more likely to say they had struggled to repay compared to parents with other repayment outcomes. Some parents also talked about helping their children repay some or all of their student loan debt. This was a question that we asked them in the interview if they had helped pay their, their children's student loans. And as you can see in that second quote on the slide, some parents are able to be a safety net for their children if they struggle. Most of the non-MSI parents who did not struggle had helped their children with their loan debt. The MSI parents were less likely to have provided this type of assistance to their children. And again, parents who defaulted and parents who had not reduced their principal balance were less likely to say that they had helped pay their children's student loans. Children who come from families that can afford to help them with their debt can get ahead faster in life than those whose families cannot, which can increase intergenerational wealth differences. So based on this research, we have some suggestions to um, help improve knowledge and outcomes. This first group of suggestions is related to narrowing the gap between college costs and available aid. Some plus borrowing is in response to unexpected expenses or financial setbacks, and schools may be able to reduce the reliance on borrowing for emergency situations by having a robust emergency aid program. Usually though, plus loans are borrowed to address unmet need gaps. Increasing funding at MSIs would allow these institutions to provide more and larger grants to needy students. Schools may also be able to use nudges and coaching to improve FAFSA completion rates, awareness of on or off campus resources, or other things that can help families reduce their reliance on plus borrowing. And then this last bullet talks about zero EFC students. Zero EFC students are students whose families have been determined by the federal government to have an income that does not allow them to provide financial support to their children's higher education because that income is so low. If more federal and state grant resources can be made available to these students, then these families who are least able to take on loan debt may be able to avoid having to borrow plus loans. And then the second group of suggestions is related to improving the understanding of the rights and obligations associated with plus borrowing. Of course, most parents borrowing these loans are probably familiar with repaying loans in general, but the plus program has unique features that parents may not be familiar with. So uh, we believe it would be helpful to have informational materials and workshops designed specifically for parents about the Parent Plus Loan Program. Additionally, including parents in behavioral nudge campaigns may be helpful. Many schools already have texting campaigns to nudge their students, so schools may consider allowing parents to opt in to a campaign specifically related to PLUS repayment. Schools can also provide realistic expectations of costs, especially for future years. Many of the parents we talked to were surprised by how much tuition and fees increased, even in just a year or two. It was more than they planned for. And for these parents who are planning ahead, it could also be helpful to have a program that guarantees or freezes tuition costs. And lastly, local employers and financial counselors should include information about PLUS loans in their retirement planning materials and sessions. As more and more parents borrow for their children's education, more and more future retirees will have to figure out how PLUS repayment fits into their retirement plans. And that is, uh, that's it for our presentation today. Please follow us on Twitter again, at Trellis Research, so you can get the most up-to-date information on what we're working on and breaking news on our reports being released. And uh, again, thank you for joining us today, and we're happy to answer any questions that we can. We'll uh, just take a moment here to take a look at what's in the queue. Again, you can submit your questions through the Q&A um, feature at the bottom of your screen with the Zoom window, or you can chat them to us if you'd like. Um, and if there's something you think of at a later time, feel free to email the researchers uh, contact information listed here directly. Uh, but we'll you know, wait another you know, minute or two, and if any questions pop up, we're happy to answer them live here. Oh, and it looks like we got one. And this is from Peyton. Peyton's question is, what recommendations would you make to FSA directly to address the issue of increasing default rates on Parent PLUS loans? Um, well, good question. Um, I think in general, uh, things that make college more affordable 
and the necessity of having to rely on plus loans. I think those things would be beneficial. Um, providing information about, um, so you have required loan counseling uh, if you're a student, but that's not required for parents. Um, there's also many other policy recommendations uh, that have been uh, touted by various uh, think tanks. Um, uh, some would do things such as um, uh, for those who don't have adequate credit scores, uh, they would uh, transfer the ability to borrow uh, away from the parents and towards the students. So increase the loan limits for those students. We're not really endorsing that necessarily, um, but I believe that FSA uh, can do things in the way of allowing parents to be more informed. We did find a lot of parents who were thrown off by the whole concept of interest um, and were, you know, consequently surprised at the amount that they had to repay. Um, I think NextGen has a lot of good opportunities to provide uh, on, you know, just-in-time communication to parents uh, to help guide them through that process. And we have another question from Alex. Um, what software have you seen that helps Parent Plus borrowers analyze their loans over the loan life cycle? Uh, I'm unaware of uh, software. There may be uh, ones out there. Um, um, I think that uh, servicers, I know for student loans, servicers tend to offer some um, pretty good information to the borrowers. And um, honestly, that's a very good question that I've never thought about before. I wonder if they do something similar for the parent borrowers as well. But um, that's a good thing to look into. Thank you. Okay, if there's any other questions, we'll taking our final ones now. And if not, again, the contact information from our presenters is on your screen right now. So feel free to you know, connect with them directly if you have further questions or if you think of something at a later time. And again, we appreciate you all taking time from your day to join us today. Thank you. And um, the recording and the webinar slide deck will be available uh, to all attendees. And that question just came in. So yes, this PowerPoint and the recording from the webinar will be available within the next week or two. Uh, please keep an eye out on your email uh, for that. And, and it looks like we have one more question that came in just as we were wrapping up. Um, and that is, will the monthly repayment note increase as more money is borrowed? Generally, yes. It probably depends on the um, repayment plan that they're under. Um, but in general, yes. The more, the more they've borrowed, the higher the monthly payment will be. And it's probably good to note also that for uh, the PLUS program, parents don't have access to the same range of repayment options that students have. And in particular, they don't have access to income-driven repayment options. And that is one of the things that hasn't been in discussion as um, there's been attempts to reauthorize the Higher Education Act. Okay, with that, we'll wrap up. Thanks again for all of your questions and for joining us this afternoon. We will be following up with the um, recording shortly. And actually, there's more questions popping up now. So do you think that improving the application process can help? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, it's interesting what we learned, and this is something you don't really get from just looking at the loan records, but when you actually talk to parents, uh, you learn more about what are the dynamics when they go to take out that loan. And we had many people who told us that, um, you know, they had thought, you know, they would call it financial aid, but it's grants. They thought that would cover it and that they wouldn't necessarily have to borrow themselves. Uh, and so it came down to either you take out that plus loan or you don't uh, your child can't go to school. And so the dynamic is, this is sort of a do or drop out, you know, or don't enroll situation. 
and it's not really the most conducive to better understanding this as the best way to finance uh, the education. Uh, so having the application process, um, uh, and I think schools can do things also in some of the orientation sessions to better convey some of that information. Well, it looks like we have another one. Do you recommend families tap into retirement funds over applying for a PLUS loan? And I think generally from what I've seen from um, financial counselors um, is that you should not tap into your retirement funds if you can help it. Um, but you know that's kind of where some of our, our recommendations come in where this loan program is becoming so big with so many millions of parents now using it that it's it has to be in the conversation of of how does one plan for retirement um, as well as manage their other financial obligations. Um, so, you know, I think uh, I don't, I'm not a financial counselor, so I don't, I don't think I could give a definitive answer on that, but um, I do think it's very important that it's in the conversation, especially around retirement, um, that parents should be able to get uh, more clear answers on that. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, among the parents that we spoke with, uh, many of them had a pretty decent idea that the process of repaying the PLUS loans was going to make their retirement all that much more difficult. And the degree to which these parents were willing to sacrifice for their parents was really, um, you know, quite moving, actually. Um, so, but it's a sacrifice that really shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't have to be making uh, in this country. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, I do think there needs to be that conversation. Every family's going to have different financial circumstances um, and can weigh that kind of decision. But in general, you don't really want to tap into, you know, especially if there's penalties for early withdrawal and things like that. Um, um, but there's a lot of ways that one can think about, you know, lowering your costs um, and that's a whole other discussion. Um, so another question, did you hear from parents that they would like income-based repayment options? Um, so I, in those exact words, not, uh, not in those exact words, I would say, but there were many parents that we talked to who were finding themselves in situations where they had um, employment issues um, or health issues where they were finding it hard to keep up with the loan payments and they were really struggling. And I think for parents like that, an income-based repayment option would have been much more welcome than being on forbearance for a long period of time and seeing that, you know, all the consequences of that. So I do, I do think that parents would have, have liked, uh, some of these parents would have liked an income-based repayment option. And then another question, um, did parents mention having trouble figuring out how much to borrow? Since the application gives them the option to borrow up to cost of attendance, did parents choose that option when they might not have needed to? Um, so that's a very good question. Um, a lot of the parents that we talked to had what they felt like was a good idea of what they would need. And that's where some of the surprise came in, where they felt like, we know year one, this is the gap that we have that we're gonna fill. And then they would multiply that by four in their head or whatever the situation was. And then the next year tuition and fees increase 4% and then they've, you know, they're already off. Um, so I, it's, I think for a lot of parents, they plan that out very carefully. And then we talked to other parents who very literally said, um, we just went, with the flow <laughs> that we got into the office and they said, here's what you're short on and here's how you can fill that. And so then that's what they signed. Um, so it's really a, a wide variation of experiences, I think. Okay, and then uh, what was the most misunderstood financial literacy topic by parents regarding PLUS loans, excluding interest rates and or their previous expectations before applying for the loan? Excluding interest rates. Okay, so not including interest rates. 
or their previous expectations? Hmm. Um, I would say that um, we heard from many parents that they they didn't expect the consequences of delaying payments using deferments and forbearances. They didn't expect how much that would really impact the end result of their loan. And so there were, there's a great quote in the paper somewhere about um, putting a Band-Aid on a gusher. <laughs> That's uh, really excellent. And I would encourage people to read the report <laughs> and see that. Um, that just, yeah, they, they didn't um, foresee how difficult it would make repaying later because they just really needed to delay at the time. Yeah, I also think uh, general budgeting uh, was problematic for a lot of the parents. And so part of that, you know, it has to do with, you know, what's your uh, income, your revenue, and what is the price of college. And so for both of those, those things aren't necessarily, you know, carved in stone. And so for the cost of education, uh, they don't really know what they may have known the first year what they were expected to pay and how much financial aid, but sometimes that changes uh, in year two or three or four. Uh, they also were um, not comforted by their children who took longer than the expected amount of time, and so that was additional years that they had to borrow. So that was kind of a shocker and something you know, that would have been hard for them to budget up front. Um, and as far as their income, you know, some, uh, you know, th some of the people in the study were impacted by the recession and some of those effects. And so they had budgeted, presuming that their incomes would be relatively stable. But what we learned is, you know, a lot of parents, you know, in that certain age, uh, they can lose their jobs um, and finding a job that will uh, pay as much as they once made uh, is really a challenge. And so it was a difficult budget decision for them to wrangle when, you know, they are unsure of what the actual cost is going to be when all this is said and done and how much uh, income that they would have available to repay the loan. Okay, so we got one saying, are you saying alternative student loans from a bank is better than a direct student loan? And I don't think we've addressed this at all. So I don't remember talking about this before, but um, I, we don't, we don't really get into that at all in, in this report. And it's, it's not a comparison that we've made with our research. Yeah. And I think, you know, it may vary based on the, your credit score and credit worthiness. Uh, there may be people who can get loans through the private market uh, at pretty favorable rates if they have a pretty secure credit situation. Uh, for many, uh, they don't, you know, they don't enjoy that uh, situation. Um, so it's an individual decision. We recommend people talking to their financial aid office uh, about what their options are. Okay. Um, did you interview any parents that had trouble making payments due to identity verification issues? Uh, no, we, we didn't get any of that in any of our interviews. Okay, I think we've reached the end of the list of questions that we had. Um, so if there's any last second ones, right here. I, I typed I some answers there, but I was not sure if, um, if I addressed the question. It looks like uh, the alternative student loan um, or not staffer loans or private loans. I was not quite sure uh, what the question was about. And can you, uh, Lisa Briggs clarify that? Because uh, we did have some comparison with staffer loans in another report. Um, and then Jeff just mentioned the op an option of borrowing private, lo private loans um, with probably better terms if they can have, if the borrowers have better credit score. But um, I'm not sure if there are other alternatives that are not addressed. Right, yeah, I think, I think that's basically it is, it's kind of an individual 
situation. It just depends on the individual's um, credit worthiness and whatnot. So, yeah, typically if they have good credit um, score, they might be able to get um, private loan as well. So. And Wenhua, do you have any other sort of closing comments you would like to add? Um, no. <laughs> Thanks. Well, feel free to contact us for any questions, further questions. Okay. So did Thank we have you. an additional question? Um, so it looks like Sue is clarifying what alternative loans mean. Thank you, Sue. Um, okay. And looks like the last one here. Did any interviewees mention the financial literacy resources on FSA site and whether they were helpful or not, particularly the calculator tools for Parent PLUS loans? Um, we, they didn't specifically mention that, I will say. Um, they, we asked them just sort of a general, uh, where did you get information if you got information? And some of them mentioned that they looked things up online, so it's possible that they had come across that and used it, but no one specifically said it. So I couldn't say. <laughs> yeah, and they don't always like remember exactly, uh, yeah. you know, where they got certain information. That was the um, problem is this, this study is a, is a retrospective. <laughs> so it's the, when they were looking into borrowing these loans, it could have been 10 years before. Um, so we, we really couldn't get very specific with what they came across to get their information as much as we would have liked to have done that. Yeah, but it also speaks to they don't understand that that's a continuing resource right. for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, uh, I think there's possibilities in the with NextGen to improve that kind of communication because things can pop up and the borrowers, you know, the parent borrowers may not know and remember oh yeah, if something happens, I should go to this website. Um, but if there was a, a good communication channel as envisioned in NextGen, uh, I think you can improve uh, their ability to get those kind of responses and to understand that the materials and resources FSA provide is an ongoing uh, uh, source that they can draw from. Okay, we really appreciate uh, y'all participating here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, encourage you to check uh, the uh, new study and to follow us on Twitter at Trellis Research. And we'll be uh, producing some briefs and you know, we've got some other good reports coming up. Uh, not long from now, we'll have results from our uh, Student Financial Wellness Survey. Uh, and we're real excited to share that information with you. Uh, Thank you for participating.